to the We Are Film podcast with your hosts, Cameron Gallagher and Zach Pouye. Welcome, welcome. Wow. We are back. It is, of course, myself, Cameron Gallagher, and who's next to me? I am literally right next to you. I'm <laughs> also, my name is Zach Pouye. <laughs> and we have someone very special across the country on Zoom. Can you introduce yourself, sir? Hello, my name is Ryan Godoy. I'm a director. I like it. So we have gotten in contact quite a while back. I feel like we sort of first started chatting and, you know, we realized we were in this like horror community and we were like, oh, like we need to get you on the podcast and talk about some stuff and some of your work. Awesome. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I think we want to jump right in with kind of some, you know, backstory. I don't know if actually we even talked about this, but st- I think we would love to know how you got into filmmaking and, and in particular, like horror filmmaking. Yeah, totally. Um, I've, you know, it's, uh, it all started back when I watched my favorite movie for the first time when I was in junior high, which is signs. Uh, very cool. I was watching that as a kid and some things just happened in that movie that, <laughs> shook me to my core and i said man i want to do that to other people like that was that was a blast i love that movie i watched it like two days ago i watch it all the time and um so i got into filmmaking then i started making janky videos with my friends with my parents you know mini dv camera just home camera and uh went on through high school uh, found some different interests in high school kind of fell away from filmmaking but by the uh by the end of high school i returned to it and just said like oh this is this is all i want to do and so after that i started i started making videos for the church that i attended and um i just made videos for so long up there that they eventually gave me a job and so that kind of turned into a full-time gig where i'm making videos regularly um lots of people are seeing them and so I really got to hone a lot of my, my skills and my craft in that way, just making videos all the time. And then a couple of years after that, I was like, you know, this uh, whole dream of being a director isn't going to just like fall into my lap one day. No one's going to hand it to me. And so I started taking it more seriously and started trying to uh, go the direction that I was hoping my life would go, but actually take charge of it myself. And through that, I, you know, I've always loved horror movies. It's always been my favorite genre and always been a genre that I really connected to always was the type of short films I was making. So I just headed in that direction because I love it. Now you're here (laughs) and here I am. I know. So actually it's funny. We, I just saw your, your last video that went up and it was, I love that you were kind of getting real with people on, uh, for the listeners too, you make like tutorials as well, or I guess sort of like, I don't know if I want to say tutorials because there's some that are tutorials, but some were just like topics which I enjoy. I really enjoy the fact that they're just like, I'm going to talk about something and come join yeah. me. <laughs> so yeah, totally. for you, you know, you started with horror. It was what you're into. Was there like a moment where you're like, I'm going to, I need to take this serious. Like what you're saying that kind of like, I'm going to take this seriously. Was there like a, a moment or something that happened or anything that kind of like really pushed you in that? I don't remember like a specific moment. I could tell you when it was, it was sometime in like early 2017 that I'd been, I mean, I'd spent a lot of time like just doing tutorials. I'd spent a lot of time making videos, making a lot of janky short films that are not on my YouTube channel that no one (laughs) will probably ever see doing a lot of VFX, doing a lot of sound experiments, but it was all just kind of like hobby, big dream. Um, no actual action of like, Oh, if somebody came and handed me a million dollars right now and said, go make a movie, would I be able to do it? And it's, that would be terrifying when you don't have, when you haven't practiced enough, it's like, I don't know, someone handing you a basketball and saying, go play in the NBA. You're (laughs) like, well, I haven't trained at all. (laughs) So, uh, that's when I said, to myself like i need to start like making short films taking it seriously and actually honing my craft so that you know if someone ever does hand me a million dollars which they probably won't uh i will be able to go make it or if it comes to the point where i need to fund my own million dollars to make a feature 
then I will be ready and not just a scrub that's been dreaming about it for years. I feel like that's everybody, right? We're all like that. Like there's that moment where you're like, oh shit, I got to do this for real. Like I got to make this legit. Yeah. And yeah. Then of course, like the first couple of things is like, well, I just need to have something to fill out like an, you know, an hour, hour and a half runtime. Uh, and then yeah. you just start like picking apart that. Um, did you ever start thinking like once you started to make um, longer films, uh, like where they should go? Like, did you have like a direction that you were like, oh, I've seen people do this. This is kind of like the best way to get something distributed. Or were you like us? We were like, oh, yeah, that has to happen before people will just like want to buy something. <laughs> um, I mean, my my. I guess game plan from the beginning was always just make films, make short films and then share them online and just keep doing that until I build some sort of credibility, uh, build some sort of audience so that maybe in the future when I do attempt to self fund a feature or I, I get a feature made, there's a built in audience already of people that are rooting for me or people that are fans of my work. And th yeah, the plan has always just been like, create share repeat and uh and usually try to do something with each film that is different from the last at least that's an attempt like with the last short film i released every night i see them the entire reason i made that short film was because i wanted practice directing dialogue due to mm -hmm. the fact that all of my previous short films didn't have any dialogue so that was the whole reason for that that short film. And I think that's one of the things that made it kind of stand out. And so that's what I want to do moving forward with other short films is like, what haven't I done or what can I experiment with in this safe, quick way so that it's not the amount of pressure and the amount of stakes that there would be if I were doing it on a feature that had a lot more, I don't know, financial stakes. Now, you did have a paid gig that I thought was really interesting when we were talking uh, recently, and I, th I thought that was really cool. I don't know how much you can go into that whole scenario, but I would love to know, and I think the listeners are really, really interested as to, you know, obviously the goal is to like do this as a job and, you know, you got to do that, right? So I think people would love to know maybe how that came about, what that was like, and sort of, you know... And then we had talked to sort of how that all sort of panned out in, in your eyes. Yeah, totally. The, uh, the paid gig that Cameron is referring to is that I directed a short horror film for a company called hooked and hooked is, I'm, I'm not sure what hooked is up to right now. Their whole, their whole model seems to be shifting and changing and mm. I can't keep up with them. <laughs> but at the time it was a, a phone app that you could read stories on, but the stories were presented in a way that it looked like um, it looked like a text message conversation that you just happened to stumble upon between two people. And so it'd be like, oh, a mom and a daughter texting, but something creepy is happening. And that was kind of the, the whole hook of the Hooked app is that it was kind of like a new way to get people to read that are from this digital era. And right. they were attempting to pivot some of their some of their like uh, just pivot their attention towards short films and it looked like they were focusing much like most of their stories on their app towards romance and horror and so i think they actually reached out to my buddy danny donahue first yep yeah, yeah. he's a credible guy on youtube and um he's got a lot of great short films he's a good friend of mine and a lot of i I attribute a lot of my success and connections to him. He's a really cool guy that's helped me out a lot. And I think he was working on something else at the time. So he turned them down, but he pointed them in my direction. And so hooked reach out to me and offered for me to read some of their stories and see if I had any interest in directing some of them. I sent them some of my, some of my work. They sent me some of their stories. I told them just kind of really just in a sense or two, what kind of direction I would take it. And uh, they accepted, and it was a, a really good situation. They paid me, a, or they, they gave me a certain budget for the film, and it was kind of like, here's your budget, bring us a film. There wasn't really like an allocation of 
Mm. This had to go to this and this had to go to that. And you can only have this much. It was really do whatever you want with this amount of money, as long as you bring us back a film. And so uh, I did not end up paying myself as (laughs) I feel like we mostly don't. Typical, right? I think I actually, yeah, I think I actually probably came out of that with a small loss in the end of it, but it was worth it because I got to work with a company. I got to really like, that was the first time I got to experience like the casting process and actually being in charge of a set before that I'd been on sets and been a subordinate of some other director. (laughs) No, not really, but yeah, I'd been on sets and stuff, but it was really cool to be in charge and like feel that responsibility of running a set. And yeah, just, it, it felt like it fit. I'd been practicing for it for a long time and it was a, it was a really great experience. Now, I think it'd be cool to go into some of the technical, because I think, again, it's kind of that for some people, and, and I think for all of us, really, is kind of the dream, right? Like, you know, the, the first step, and especially, like, you, you're getting paid to do this, and you're you're kind of, you know, it, it's a for hire in a sense, right? Even though, yeah, like you're saying, you probably lost a little bit of money, which is, you know, all of us, but... What was like the the nitty gritty of that? Like t- saying, okay, now I have a budget. Now I have stuff to do. Um, you know, even the casting process. Like, I'm I'm super curious about how you went about that because obviously, like for us, I mean, uh, you know, there, there's a we're we're in a slimmer area of people, so we have to be. You know, it's a little bit harder. And I, so I'm just curious, like how that kind of went to all that that sort of technical stuff of getting it together. Totally. Um, I I didn't go to film school, so. I don't feel like I have a plethora of like connections that are at my same level. A lot of my connections at the time felt like they were like above me. They were like above my pay grade. Mm. So when it came to, um, when it came to like crewing up and stuff, I really didn't have that many connections at the time to make it happen. So I actually reached out to a friend that I knew had recently graduated from film school and said, Hey, do you like, do you know people that can, can help me out. This is like a low budget situation. I don't have a lot of money to pay people. Maybe some people that are like just graduating would be excited to work on this. So he connected me with somebody that had just graduated. That was um, like their focus was producing and cinematography. And so she helped me out a ton. Uh, She handled a lot of the logistics that I really just didn't know about at the time. Mm -hmm. It was super helpful. And without that experience, I don't know that I would have been able to pull off my most recent short horror film every night I see them without having like learned so much from that experience, having learned so much from her and how she handled the casting process and how she divvied up the budget and stuff. So that was a super cool experience. And so that short film was crewed up by a lot of college kids and people that had just graduated college and it it worked out really well. Everyone was just happy to be working. Everyone's happy to be on like a set that was that you know, it wasn't just a student film that was going to be shown at school. It's like, Oh, this is for an app. This is cool. This is, uh, this is like, you know, the dream. And so it worked out a lot. And, uh, yeah, the nitty gritty was, I think I went a little overboard on crew. I think I was feeling like, Oh, I got this budget. Now I can get everything. I can have (laughs) the director of photography. I can have the first AD. I can have the DIT. I can have an editor, all these things I've never had before. And so I think that was kind of just like a bit of a growing pain. I think I went a little bit overboard where it might've been able to be quicker and a little bit more efficient if I had slimmed down on how many people were on set and how many people's um, hands were in the pot of that situation. But it, it worked out great. And that's another thing that I learned for my next short film is like, by the time I got to there, to that film, I knew exactly what was important to me, exactly who the most important people on set were for me. So I could focus all my energy on a smaller crew and, and maybe make something that's more efficient in my eyes. When it came to uh, like picking your, your crew, like your director of photography and, and stuff like that, I know with like, our short films, uh, there's always like this looming feeling over Cameron's head where it's like, oh man, it'd be really nice to just get these like anamorphic lenses, but I don't think spending $5,000 to rent something is, is going to be efficient. 
Uh, when it comes to something where you actually are like given a budget like that, is there any like um, planning that kind of went into like, oh, I kind of want it to look like this. So maybe we can go with this camera or I'm familiar with this camera. Maybe we can rent this. Or is it like you hire a DP and whatever gear they have is you, you're just paying their day rate to kind of to get something like that? Yeah. Um, the budget wasn't big enough to dream that big. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I definitely, my, my kind of style for the look of a film is usually pretty clean. I, I, I generally like pretty modern lenses and stuff. So really most of the stuff that you can rent and, and, and DPs already have available to them works pretty well for me. The, the thing that I, wanted to like push to the next level when it came to budget was location and set design. Yeah. Those are the things I've learned recently over the last couple of years that are like way more important to me than the camera and lens. This is like that stuff that is in front of the camera and lens. Uh, just, it makes such a world of a difference and like haze and stuff and lighting. So that's the stuff that we kind of, uh, probably splurge a little bit more on was like the yeah. location for the hooked short ended up being such a huge chunk of the budget, but it's like, it wouldn't have worked otherwise. And that's, that's where I've put a lot of focus recently. That's a, that's actually yeah. basically what it usually comes down with us too, is we've been just using our camera that we use for commercial work. So we have that already. And uh, especially with like, well, the, the most recent short that we did it, Luckily, the locations were free because it was like a school and uh, our buddy just had a location. Uh, but yeah, being able to like put your your characters into an environment that feels like it's lived in and it's real. Real, yeah. That, that I think that's like the big... It, it, what, you know, we were lucky enough on, on the Rickety Man to work with like a costume designer. And although like that was so specific because obviously it's period, but it did open my eyes to like, wow when you have these people that have such attention to detail of makeup, costume, production design, it really does. Like it takes it to a whole new level where I don't know if we would have shot anything on anamorphic lenses or whatever. Sure. It may have a specific look to it, but I don't think it would ever actually like matter. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, totally. I love set design location. It's so big. Right. And especially in horror, I feel like where you're typically using the location or set design to your advantage, like it, it's part of the horrific part, you know, you're using yeah. walls or doors or whatever to create a scare. So if, if it's lame, it's just going to be lame. And it's, it's so nice having those people that are thinking about it, are creative, are skilled on every night I see them. I think it was the day before we shot. Um, my set designer and makeup artist on that short, uh, her name is Danny. She texts me and she's like, what should we have on the table? And I hadn't even thought of it. They're just sitting at a table. I was like, uh, I don't know, nothing. And then she sent me a picture. She's like, how about like some drawings of sketches of like the creature that he's afraid of? I'm like, this is genius. He's already holding a pencil. That's like the whole thing. Maybe he's holding a pencil because he was, drawing the things he's terrified yeah and it just filled up the set and it looked good it added an extra creepy thing we like added a little moment to it on set that day because it was there and i think it just it added so much life to the scene that was going to be just a empty table before that with maybe like a coffee cup or something so yeah having talented people to help you out i love it let's actually talk about every night i see them i'd love to know who you did have on crew, like what were the, what were the crew members that you had on there and sort of some of the stuff that they brought or, you know, some things that were important to you in that short. Cause I know we had talked and, and I know you've kind of talked about on the, ch on the channel, the idea of working with uh, a writer and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I think I'd love to know about like the whole crew, what you guys had going on and sort of what were some things you took out of it? Totally. Yeah. The, so I'll start with the three most important people to have on set for me at the moment that like I want on every set is a set designer. Um, someone just to help out with the look of the scene and to just like catch those little nuances and like place a lamp here and a picture frame there. And it, it helps me out so much. And I look at the 
the camera frame and I'm like, dang, you just enhanced it so much. Thank you. Um, the other one is director of photography. It's just so nice to be able to, it's like, I know how to work a camera, but I don't want to be messing with so many technical little things and worrying about the ISO and the white balance and all these little things when there's other things to be wor worrying about. And the director of photography not only takes care of those things, but also brings, I worked with uh, Paul Houston on every night I see them and he brought so much experience and like help to me. He's, he's been on way more sets than, than me. And like, he was someone I could look to if I was feeling like, I don't know, like unsure about something like, am I doing this right? You could be like, <laughs> so right, yeah. he, he helped me out so much. He brought so much experience and, and just helped the look of the film so much. He, he went above and beyond. He had some like, 3d storyboards that he made ahead of time and yeah love having That's that guy awesome. on set can't wait to work with him again and then the other the third person that is essential to me is a sound mixer and you know doubles as a boom op with my size budget yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's just another thing that i don't have to worry about and i can just be like confident all the time that it's going to be sounding good with you know on the short films that you're running around with it's just you and your friends it's just a nightmare worrying about sound. Yeah. I was gonna say if you if you have a boom up and a sound mixer, it's like you're not you've worried about anything else. <laughs> you've hit you've yeah. that's when you made it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the greatest. And you know, uh the fourth person is the director, but that's me luckily on on the things I shoot. So those four people, if they're there, it's like something's gonna get made. And then with every night I see them, I worked with a writer that I had met through the uh the hooked app experience after i made my short film and it was released on their app he had been the writer on one of the other short films that were made for the app and so we kind of just like hey we're doing the same thing yeah. we kind of connected over instagram and it we started chatting realized we got along real well realized we had uh, similar styles and and interests and so that turned into let's write something and so he's kind of the guy that I said, Hey, I want to make something that's all dialogue based. I don't feel like super proficient at writing dialogue. This is like your thing. You write for a text app that is only dialogue. Right. Why don't we make something happen? So I gave him the parameters of it's dialogue driven. It takes place in a kitchen and it's horror. And so after that, he came back to me with a script. I made a couple notes and i said oh man this is great like let's shoot this and so then thinking back to my my hooked short experience i was like oh i need a producer again because now i'm a big shot <laughs> and so i i reached out to one of those producers that is above my pay grade to ask her it, it was a different person that that i'd worked with on the hook short i asked her like hey do you know anybody that's looking to produce and she's like oh let me read the script she read the script. She uh, ripped it a new one because it sucked. And it was like the greatest thing that could have happened because, uh, yeah, the first script wasn't good. I was feeling great about it at the time. And so then Kate and I went back and we rewrote it like 15 times. And then we finally made it. Yeah. I don't so know those I mean. are the, the essential people that were on, on board for every night I see them other than like other cast and crew. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's always the best thing to when someone rips the script apart, but it is always refreshing to just be like, yeah, oh, you're right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know we've been so lucky to work with Jeremiah, who we did The Rickety Man with and, and just loosed with. And like having somebody who is not only so skilled at writing and, and just being so, you know, just having their own intelligence in, in their field, but also and it sounds like you're about the same, you know, lucky enough to have somebody who's very collaborative where we can all sit down and say like, this is what we're thinking. This is what we're feeling. And, and I definitely, and obviously everything starts with that story too. So it's like, if you have a good story, it just sets you up to make good things. <laughs> totally. Yeah. It was great working with Cade. Cade Scott was the, uh, the guy that wrote every night I see them with me. And, uh, yeah, I hope to work with him again in the future. So what do you think is the toughest thing about being a filmmaker, but especially like a horror film, like a narrative filmmaker these days? Cause I feel like it, there's a lot of tough stuff. 
I mean, one tough thing is that the market is pretty saturated. It's not like ridiculously saturated, but there's new short horror films dropping on YouTube daily. Yeah. The quality fluctuates of what's being dropped, but also the views don't always match what I would view as quality. 100%. And so that's kind of a <laughs> that's kind of a tricky thing to to navigate is like I don't you see other short horror films on YouTube get like crazy views and just to not like I don't know chase that as the that's the pinnacle of what you're going for you're not I'm not I always have to remind myself that I'm like I'm, my goal is to not get like a million views on a short horror film my goal is to make feature length movies yeah and so <laughs> not to like I don't know compare to not to compare and to not try to feel like I need to compete with the never ending uh, short horror films that are just dropping daily. Right. The machine. I feel like, I feel like honestly too, the more people I know that are doing bigger things don't have any short films with a lot of views or if they do, it's like one of them or two, you know what I mean? Like it's, I mean, the amount of people that we've talked to or met and it's just like, these people have, are like not even on the internet. <laughs> so, yeah. And yeah. Somehow they're doing it. We we did realize that, um, that it's, it's gotten a, a little bit easier um, on our egos when like you look up like a Netflix um, like director or producer and you go and like find them on social media and it's like most of the photos are like, they have like two or three behind the scenes photos and something like that and then it's like they don't actually know how to use the internet to begin with right. because it's like they're they're pretty traditional and it's yeah. like okay so we don't have to like if we're not doing that great if like you know this influencer over here uh were to look at us and be like yeah what so what of you guys yeah, yeah. You're, you're not comparing to us i'm like yeah but it doesn't matter because people that yeah. were uh, striving to be more like uh, are more like us. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. So do you think that, you know, seeing these challenges and seeing the idea that it's a saturated market and there's a lot going on, what do you feel like you've tried to, you know, kind of going forward in the future? Are there things that you're looking at or there, there are there options that you're thinking about or, or just in general, you know, what's the kind of plan to sort of combat that? It's a plan that I have that I don't think I stick to very well, but the plan for me is that when I make a short film, a short horror film, that it should kind of be like a, like a, almost like a startup of a business. Like yeah. there should be a script that goes along with it, or at least a treatment and a plan of how, like, this is kind of a proof of concept of something that can return an investment. And so uh, I did, I, I wanted that to be what every night I see them was, but I did not have the Kate and I racked our brains for a while of how, like, what is the feature of this? And we just didn't quite know. I feel like I'm finally starting to break it recently. Yeah. But that's, that's kind of my, my game plan is when I make a short horror film to have a backup plan behind it so that if anything does come of it, I'm ready when opportunity knocks and not just like a deer in the headlights. Right. Cause I feel like we hear a lot of stories about people like, Oh, I had this cool idea. And I think we even know some people that have like, Oh, I had this really cool short and this like cool idea. And then it got huge online or somebody came knocking and all of a sudden it's like, uh Oh, I actually don't have this. And then suddenly it's like not a missed opportunity, but kind of, you know, where you sort of yeah. like, Oh man, I mean, or you end up with an hour and a half or 45 minutes is like filler because you just didn't know what to do. I mean, I kind of got caught like that where it was a couple of years ago. I had a short that got a, like a little bit of attention and it got attention of a, a management company. And it was one of those things where it was like, I had never thought about the feature version of it whatsoever. And like, I had to like work backwards to get this idea. And then by the time I got all the way there, it already had kind of like, you know, well, it doesn't matter anymore. Like we, you know, we're, we're kind of past that. And it's like, Oh, if I only would have had something, not saying it would have worked out, but maybe I would have been in a better spot because of it. Totally. It might've just been even an opportunity to learn more 
if you've gotten a little further in the process. Right. Yeah. And that's what a lot of it is just like learning. Like, can you learn more? I mean, that's why we someone do the podcast is we talk to people and we get to learn things that you wouldn't normally maybe know or, or ever even think of. So hypothetically, if someone came to you and they're like, so I want to know the full story of hell no. Uh, what more do you have to offer <laughs> of the one? Nope. No, you're thinking nope. Or nope. That's what it is. Nope. <laughs> And one nope. Hell no. <laughs> hell no. Doesn't he say that at one point in, in the script or in the short? I think he says something like that. Yeah. Nope. Uh, I, I love comedy. So like that one was, uh, I was dying at that one. Also, I, it seems like, uh, like we were talking about like the numbers game. It's a, when the fact that it's a short horror comedy um, probably drove like a wider audience because the horror genre is so niche um, yeah. little yeah. things like that. It really kind of goes to show like your pacing also really works really well. So you can, uh, you have versatility, which is something well, thank that you, is, thank <laughs> you. If yeah. You, if you look that at, one like, blew a, up off of Reddit years ago because you know, it's like everyone can say, yeah, that's what I would do. So it's like relatable. So that's right. why that one blew up, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you have in store for the future? I know you can't probably tell us too much, but is there anything that you're, thinking about planning, you know, you're, uh, you're prepared for, I guess, or, or, or moving forward with. Yeah. Uh, some things like right now I'm trying to focus more on the, the, the future feature yeah. uh, that will one day be because I do like making short horror films and they are great practice, but they're not the end game. Yeah. So I'm kind of trying to shift a little bit of focus there, which is why there's no, there hasn't been a new short film in a while because I've been trying to like rack my brain. How do I get a feature happening? How do I self fund it or find investors or how do I get a script that is, is just filmable. And so I've been focusing on writing a lot lately and trying to, to get better at that while also, you know, hoping to work with Cade possibly um and some other things is that i'm just kind of mad that i haven't been on set filming something lately so i do have another short horror film hopefully in the works Very filming nice. this spring that will come out that the the planned title is the faces in the doorway super spooky Ooh, very nice <laughs> and so yeah pretty much working on a short horror film right now and also working on trying to break the feature of every night i see them write that one out and then probably write another feature by the end of 2022. And then I'd love to shoot a feature in 2023. That's just a self-imposed goal I've set for myself. We'll see if I hit it. Maybe I'll be filming on like December 29th of 2023, but <laughs> if I do that, I'll count it. That works. I, I know. I mean, we had this conversation when we had talked too. it's like, that is the end goal. And it does, it gets like, you kind of forget about it sometimes, or I feel like at least I've like, forgotten about it and i think i told you the story where we went to a film festival i, I told the uh, you know ryan the story where we we, we saw this fe there's feature that was like super low budget and it was so inspiring because you're like man they went out there and made this movie for like almost nothing like like literally maybe a couple grand total um and it not only is it amazing but it's going to be on shutter and it's like got picked up and everything and it's like boy not saying that that's always the path or like you can guarantee like, Oh, if I guarantee go make this short or this, you know, low budget feature, it's going to make it, but there's a difficulty to it. Yeah. I, although that seeing stuff like that does also kind of like add that sparked. Um, I think the biggest like switch up we've had, I don't, I think we've talked about this on the podcast before, but um, for a while it was, you know, make a bunch of things that are um, proof of concepts and prove that you can take an idea and make it look good, make it sound good and, um, you know, show that you can direct and then, um, you know, pitch that. And then maybe someone wants to buy like a full length. And then also there's like this teetering uh, concept of um, we'll just make something and make it in full and then have someone just buy it. Um, and that's, mostly due to like the pandemic, I feel like, because a lot of times people are like, um, you know, well, like half a dozen of my sets that I was supposed to, you know, yeah. fund this year were like postponed or like canceled completely. So why should I like invest into your short, uh, into, invest into your movie when like 
Um, I could just buy something that's already made and just like p- put it on like a know, good, a we, we know, yeah, like almost like it's it's yeah. a product. It's not just like a concept. Yeah, it's less of a risk for somebody, right? And it, there's it, it is so weird. How has it been for you trying to figure out the business side of it versus the the creative side? Because I feel like that's something that in the last two years we've had a big turn on. Is like, oh, we have to we have to look at this as a business. Yeah, I really personally enjoy the business side of filmmaking. I'm not like too precious about the creativity and that has to like stay away from money. I don't know. I like, I like the numbers. I like the business side of things. Yeah. I think it's fun. It's like a game to be played and like, <laughs> how do you win? Um, I, I don't think I'm an expert at it at, in any sense, but it's something that I've been enjoying figuring out. And like you guys are saying, like just make something that's complete and maybe someone will buy it or make something that's complete and maybe you just still own it. You self distribute it. And, um, that's been a model that I've also been looking at. I don't know exactly how that would go, but you know, one guy that I've been looking at recently that I think is doing some cool things is Jim Cummings. I don't know if you know about him. That sounds very familiar. Did he just put out something like in the last like year or two? I feel like he's put out like two, he's put out like three features in the last four years. He's a really cool guy to look at for a guy that's really pushing independent film and like just doing it. And yes. Okay. It. This is coming to me now. I'll say I'm like, these do look familiar. I, yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah, that's a guy that I've been looking to that I think is, is doing some cool things with indie filmmaking and uh, yeah, he just seems like he's doing a lot of things right. So that's been one of my inspirations moving forward as I've been looking at the business side of things. Yeah, it is interesting that self-distribution, like there's a couple people I know that have done like really, really low budget, like really low budget. Like, you know, we're in that same, like you're spending 10, 15 grand and then you make a feature and they're putting it on, you know, VOD in the hopes that, because I mean, I think you can fairly easily get it on like Amazon Prime and iTunes and all that Google Play or whatever the movie is for that. Yeah, the only thing I've really heard of is doing like an Amazon Prime or something yeah. where it's like you have it like on a Patreon where it's like a single, like a one-time purchase. Oh, like per- Vimeo I think does that too, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the interesting. I've heard, I don't know if it's true because I haven't done it, but is that like the Tubies of the world are making money? Really? Oh, yes. The ones that are, yeah. It's so funny you say it because I just talked with someone the other day and they were saying that one, so this this one director, he does everything super low budget and then puts them on Tubi. And I didn't know how that works. Like, I didn't know if they were like a, like it's, I'm it's, not exactly sure how it goes, but. Which one's Tubi? Uh, it, you're, it's, it's got ads. Yeah, it's not gotcha. like, it's not like okay. Peacock, yeah. Okay. I always get Tubi and Peacock mixed up and I'm like, wait, like Peacock is like NBC's. I just Tubi wasn't sure like, if it was the one that was like the, it was the vertical only, or is that one? That one? No, that was Quibi. Oh, no, that, Quibi. Okay. That one's gone. <laughs> yeah, rip Quibi. <laughs> rip Quibi. Yeah, there's like Tubi, and also it'll end up on like the Roku channel or yep. on like the Plex channel. All these ad based streaming services that apparently a lot of people, you know, there's a ton of people in the country that don't have Netflix, and they're yeah. turning to these streaming services. The free and th- there's a good chance that. You know, there's only a limited amount of decent movies on their service. Maybe they stumble upon yours, and there's a there's an AdSense kind of situation going on. That's interesting. I've never actually even thought about that because I wonder what the pay, especially if you're probably in that lower budget to that like ten, fifteen grand, where I feel like it's easier to make. You know, twenty, thirty. Because I, I remember even long ago looking at um, uh, I can't remember who it was now, um. Griffin Hammond who used to do Indie Mogul. I think he was talking about the Sriracha documentary and he was saying how like he made in like VOD sales like 30 grand. So it's like, well, if you could make your film for 15 grand, you know what I mean? There, you know, yeah. you're, you're making it. A, a, I mean, I don't know how those ads, the ads work on those, but yeah, I mean, that makes total sense. You could make something really low budget and turn it around and make some money and it'd be like a long term money. Like, you know, you just kind of let it yeah. go. It's not like you have to, keep having it licensed or whatnot. The other thing about, or at least I've heard again, I'm not fully experienced in this, but about owning your movie, 
is that, you know, you own your last three features or something that have all just been modest films. And then your fourth one blows up. Like everyone's going to want to go back and see your other work. And you're going to profit off of that. That's a really good point. I never thought about that. <laughs> right. Cause yeah. that, yeah, that, no, that's a really interesting point. Cause yeah, if you have three of them on Tubi or Roku or isn't voodoo another one too, like that kind of. You also that's like Walmart, right? Run into the issue of like no. you you have a big, you know, you hit your big break, and next thing you know, Sony wants like full, like they want you on Sony movies for the next whatever, and they also want your back catalog. And if you're distributing it to right, you know, here and there, next thing you know, I have to tell them, okay, you guys got to take it down. I got to cancel my contract, and all right, and that can become too. a mess too. Yeah, who knows, but. right? To be man, they got a pretty good. Uh, they got a solid selection of horror movies. I'll tell you that they always do. I was gonna say, I find that there's a lot of movies that I can't find anywhere else on Tubi. It's like, yeah. oh, like I was looking at this movie Cherry Falls. I don't know if you ever seen it or not, but uh, it, if you haven't seen it, very interesting movie, very good, weird movie. It turns out it's the most expensive TV movie ever made at fourteen million dollars. Um, jeez, <laughs> I know. I I didn't know that until my girlfriend searched it, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. But uh, it was on, I think the only place you could find it was on Tubi. I, I ended up buying the Blu-ray before I noticed it was on Tubi. Um, mm. But I was like, oh, wow, that's kind of weird. And there was like two other ones that were like only on Tubi. So they must be doing something right. Hmm. Yeah, Tubi. They got some deep cuts. Right. Speaking of some, some deep cuts, I'd love to know about some more influences. Because I, th I think it's really interesting you said signs. I have not heard anyone mention signs and i feel like i mean i thought that movie scared like the scene where like the alien is like that was like a birthday party or something and it comes through the um that's the moment man everyone no oh, one forgets that Joaquin's moment looking at the, the watching the tv tv yeah and it's on, in the alley oh, right okay that will forever like i remember that terrified me but i'd love to know some other influences of yours and like some other movies that you enjoy you know could be deep cuts could be recent stuff i, I think it'd just be fun to hear some other movies I enjoy. I love Signs. Um, I love um, I love M Night Shyamalan. I'll be honest. I'm like so biased. He's he's had some movies that people don't love recently. I still kind of like them. They're pretty good. <laughs> I'm um, in the camp of uh, I don't like. I think a lot of his movies. Although there's some that I, I I give him a lot of credit for, and then I'm like he sometimes like sideswipes me with something, and I'm like, oh, like why? Yeah. From what I've noticed, he well, doesn't have bad movies. He just, like, sometimes his twists are just unnecessary. And that's, like, the big tipping point for a lot of people. I thought The Village was really scary. I love The Village. The thing about, the thing that I also like about movies is that I can acknowledge that a movie's not great, but I could still like it. Oh, absolutely. So, oh, <laughs> that's half so, the movies I watch. X yeah. X-Men Origins Wolverine. <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many guilty pleasures where I'm like, I watch this movie, but I'm like, it is so bad. Yeah. But I, I don't yeah. care. I still love it. Other movies that definitely influence me that I really like are, well, I'll just hit you with two from the same director. I love Spider-Man, the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man. Love it so much. I could watch it a hundred times in like a day. It's so good. It just brings me good vibes. And I also love Drag Me to Hell which is also yeah. Sam Raimi. Yes. Have you seen that one, Zach? I don't think you have, right? That was like one where I remember seeing the trailer when I was a kid and uh, because we would have like family movie nights, my mom like didn't want to watch it. Oh, right. So yeah. she, she put the... Is that the one where it? she like turns... She's like in bed and she like... Yeah. Turn, so, okay. Yeah. I actually... It's funny. I had never seen that until... I never saw it when it came out. And when they came out with like the special edition like Scream Factory Blu-ray or whatever, a couple of years, maybe 2016 or 17... I bought it and I was like, oh, I gotta I gotta watch this. I haven't seen it. And I was blown away by it. And I and I wish Justin Long's in there, by the way. Um, I we just had a conversation about how underrated Justin Long is. <laughs> <laughs> he is underrated. Yeah. But I, I do wish that that movie got a little more credit than I think it deserves a lot more credit than it than it's ever gotten. I'll have to watch it. It's such a ridiculously well crafted film. Like it doesn't waste your time. It's over the top. It's campy. It's scary. It's funny. It's concise. It's like really close to 90 minutes, which I love. <laughs> it's got a lot of things going for it. I, I just remember it never stopped moving. And, and I love like, of yeah. course, with Raimi, it's like those style choices where he's, 
he's purposely doing things that are over the top or whatever, but they're, they're so purposeful and they feel that way where you're like, Oh, okay. Like I know I was being meant to feel this way. Is there a lot yeah. of like, close ups of women screaming? Cause I know that was a big thing in all the Spider-Man movies. Anytime you can get a close up <laughs> with somebody screaming. There, there is probably a, is. I was going to say there's quite, it feels like there's quite a bit. What about so good. some recent stuff? Like, is there any been, is there been something that's really kind of like yes. stuck out to you? Very recent film that I've really, really liked is the night house. Yeah been talking about that i saw that in theaters by myself and it scared <laughs> me like that was actually shot not too far from here too in syracuse new york so it's a couple you know, oh two, yeah two three hours i was just watching the special features they said they filmed it in like upstate new york or something yeah they uh they, there's we actually ended up near a film set and we saw some of the crew and stuff and a lot of those crew the production company that's that's in syracuse they were doing a lot of that movie and uh i guess it was a really enjoyable experience too but i, I thought it was really good yeah, big fan of that one. That's probably my favorite favorite movie of 2021. I think that's when it came out. I don't think it was 2020. I think it was 2021, yeah. Yeah, it was really good. I, I bought the Blu-ray. Every every year I try to buy at least one Blu-ray of my favorite movie of the year. So The Night House won it. And I also got old by M. Night Shyamalan. So there you go. don't come at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of... Uh, of um the the special features and stuff is there a special features on a movie that you have has really been interesting because like i have noticed a cut i know it's a i know it's a hard question but there are some ones like i was just going over the the social network behind the scenes that like Ooh, funny you say that why is that? i think the special <laughs> features that stand out to me the most is the special features of the girl with the dragon tattoo yeah Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I don't know if you. So, have you ever seen a short called AM twelve hundred? No. So you should definitely check it out because it is. It's on Vimeo, and like the first like five to seven minutes are kind of like okay. I, I wasn't totally sure if I was into it, but it is actually by the guy that did the documentaries on um the on like David Fincher. So this guy is. He also did the the Empty Man. They came out somewhat oh, yep. recently. Um, but if you haven't seen that short, you should definitely check it out because it is very, very good. And it feels like David Fincher. Like we kept referencing it when we were doing our last short because it was like we were shooting lucid. It, we were just like, what would David Fincher do? What would David Fincher do? We didn't yeah. make everybody take do like a hundred million takes. But <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, no, but that that one stands out to me a lot because that was the first time I saw how David Fincher would would block his scenes so that he could like cut it in the middle and change the timing of performances, which right. I did like three times on every night. I see them intentionally. Absolutely. That was one of the things when we actually were talking about, which, you know, with lucid drops, you've seen at this point, one yeah. of the big intentional things was how to block and I guess maybe not blocking, but sort of the coverage it's shooting coverage, coverage, coverage yeah, without like that, overdoing everything. But we had, well, five different angles of the same one conversation at yeah, the table. Yeah, but very Fincher, yeah. and, and they were actually using his conversation, this breakdown I was watching of Zodiac, where they're like, oh, his, like he shoots his conversation with like, there's like 10 camera angles, and you might say, well, that's over the top, and <laughs> coverage is whatever, but it was really interesting because they all had their own feeling to that. Um, no, but I, I, do, I do love some good behind the scenes, so I'm going to have to watch that then because that is actually, funny enough, that's a movie I haven't even seen yet. Mm. Yeah, I, that I don't I, I don't personally like I can't think of a lot of behind the scenes that's like, oh, that really stuck with me. But that one that I just rem I remember in my brain so clearly seeing the shot where they like chopped it in half and they sped up this part so that he, she looks over quicker and she walks out of the room at this point. I was like, this guy's a genius. <laughs> yeah. right? I just love the VFX in anything that they do besides the, oh, yeah. the outdoor, like they're breathing in the cold from the social network. So, yeah, like, yeah. like most of Fincher's work, he just the way he can craft a scene. So that way it will utilize minimal VFX um, to enhance it. Or when it needs to be like completely VFX heavy, um, they, they light everything very specific so that way it's like it doesn't stand out much like you know like the original like Jurassic Park when you see like the the dinosaur yeah. under the rain with the harsh lighting because they were like well we can't make soft shadows and we yeah. don't really know how to do <laughs> yeah. like soft stuff so that everything's gonna be really hard and shiny <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you had told me like 
I don't know, Gone Girl or the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Like, how much, how many VFX shots do you think are in this movie? I would have said, like, oh, not that many. And then you see the VFX breakdown, and it's like half the movie is right? just crazy. Like the most unseen, unnoticed yeah. VFX ever are the best VFX. It's like they have somebody um, with the helmet driving a motorcycle, and then they replace the <laughs> yeah. helmeted motorcycle rider with the the actress's head without a helmet and anytime there's blood it's all is it wait is it in dragon tattoo or is it was it zodiac is the other one i don't remember which one but there's one movie where all the blood in it is all of is like visual effects and it's insane crazy. fincher's yeah, love it there's actually it, it, when it comes to like feature films that are like super low budget that was very interesting uh that actually was when i was watching it, i was thinking about like you and guys like Danny, like this, there's this movie that's on shutter called the strings. Um, and I will say it is very, very slow, like definitely too slow. I think it, it could have moved a lot quicker, but it was a prime example. The guy is basically like a, a commercial DP. Like he shoots music videos and commercial stuff. And he shot this film with this one woman. And there's like one other character for like five minutes, basically and it is when it is scary it is insanely effective um but yeah it's called the strings on shutter and i and i thought about you and a few others that should definitely check it out because it was a one of those like you could make this thing for almost nothing like you know if you had yeah. one good location and one good actor or actress um even just the way it was shot you could probably have done it for you know 10 grand and uh and it felt very like a24 uh, and it felt a lot bigger because the guy was a commercial DP, but I just was like, it was very interested in that. And that was one thing I thought about recently that I was like, oh man, any horror filmmaker should check this out. It, it, you know, it's too, too slow, but <laughs> yeah, I'll, I will check that. Cause I've been looking for some like low budget inspiration lately. Yeah. That. And then the other one, which is <clears throat> the people we met and talked with was a uh, hellbender. Yep. Um, it, that that's also going to be on shutter. I think next month or something. There's a yeah. trailer out for it. Just skip the trailer and then enjoy everything as it comes to you when you watch the, the feature. That's good. I'm a trailer hater. I like to me, watch movies. Spoil just, anything, like, I don't but, even want to know the title. Don't even tell me the log line. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Start playing it. <laughs> yeah, I know. The worst is like, it's funny because I love going to the movie theater, but I hate the fact that you cannot escape the trailers. Like I didn't yep. want to watch the trailer for X, that new Ty West movie. And I didn't want to see, I feel like there was another one too. And the oh, the Texas Chainsaw movie. Massacre trailer. And that was on like a, maybe it wasn't in the theater, but either way, it's like, I, and I was like, what am I going to do? Get up and leave, like walk out in the theater <laughs> to save it. I did that once. I felt dumb. Bro, <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think I did the like close my eyes and cover my ears. Right. I'm like, I can still hear this. This is, this is messed up. But let me tell you with trailers, I always try to get to the movies like 20 minutes late because i know there's going to be so many trailers okay but one time they screwed me over i was going to go see a quiet place part two yeah those guys at amc they started the movie right on time and i missed the whole intro i was like what the heck and my buddy who had already seen it was like Dude, the intro is the best part i still haven't seen it you want to know something so me. funny it, this movie must be cursed because i went to i went to a theater so we have regal like here and i go to the theater and it's, it's quiet place too and my girlfriend and I sit down and we start watching it. And at first it is dead silent. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like it's part of the style. And it goes on for a while <laughs> and it keeps going. And I'm like, man, like they're really hammering this thing home. And I was like, I got to this one point where they like cut to a new scene. And I'm like, there's no way they would make a cut to a new scene and not have sound come in. Turns out the sound blew, like the, the oh sound system blew, but it's like the worst movie of all time to have the sound blow is A Quiet Place too. So I watched the first about 30 minutes of that movie without sound. I tell you Dang. what, there was a there was a point in time it's cursed. where I transferred from, anytime I would like download, like buy a movie digitally, I, I used to just buy them through iTunes and then I realized you could just buy like the, do the cross platform I think yeah, it's movies like anywhere. movies anywhere. Yeah. Or yeah, they changed the name. Yeah. Um, and for some reason, at, like for a couple months, anytime I bought a movie, it would auto like dub itself. Like it would switch the, the, the main language to a German dub. And, uh, <laughs> the first 15 minutes of the Joker 
in German <laughs> is actually really intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that you're sitting there watching it like, oh, no, <laughs> mom, they did it in German. What, a, what an interesting... <laughs> because I was like, weird, this looks... This doesn't look like it's in Germany, but I don't know the jer- the Joker's background. Nobody does. <laughs> and then it just keeps going, and I'm like, I don't think this is right. <laughs> <laughs> Something's up. <laughs> well, I, I like thinking of Cameron just thinking, like, man, they really committed to a quiet place, too. Like, they went full quiet. I was I was sitting there, and I'm like, it was that point where it's like that, that joke of, like, where you think something, like, you know, the idea of, like, you catch like a wine person, like you give them grape juice and they're like, Oh, this wine is aromatics of blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that was me. Like, wow. The style choice of them doing it silent. Uh, no uh, score or anything. <laughs> no, nothing. I'm like, wow, they're really doing it. But like, you could hear like subs from the other movies. So I'm like, Oh, I think it's, they're just giving you this like sub thing. <laughs> so yeah. Dumb. They're like, they want you to feel like you're deaf. Right. Yeah. They've put me in this movie. Yeah. So, if you could give advice to kind of wrap up here for any young filmmakers out there, what would be some advice that you would give to them? These people that haven't started filmmaking yet, or they've already begun their filmmaking journey. People that have begun their, like, you know, people that they've had a camera, they've maybe even made a couple short films. They're just in that sort of like, you know, maybe they're 17, 18, you know what I mean? They're, they're in that beginning stage, but they're not like total beginners. Yeah. Well, I think, um, I can attribute any amount of success that I've had to my game plan of create films and share them that has built my credibility to an extent of where, you know, when I say that I'm a director or I want to be a filmmaker, that kind of thing, there's some proof, there's some money where my mouth is that people can go, they can check the receipts. They're like, okay, he's doing it. And, and that stuff has led to me, um, growing connections with people, with like-minded filmmakers, with other people that want to be part of film that can connect with me. Like I wouldn't be here on this podcast with you if I only said I want to make movies and I had nothing to show for it. So that kind of thing. So really it's create, just create, keep creating movies. Even if it feels like you're getting no traction, put them out there, market yourself, get a little bit out of your comfort zone and then from that try to leverage that into talking with people and and growing your connections because now you've got some credibility and uh, people want to hop on the train that is moving forward so you got to make yourself that train that's moving forward well, that was pretty well said i like that i like that yeah so where can people find you for all the listeners out there where should they be finding on the internet go go to my youtube it's it's at ryan godoy youtube.com slash Ryan Godoy, R-Y-A-N-G-O-D-O-Y. That's the best place. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter. Go check me out. All the places. Go, go watch a go watch a movie. Yes, definitely go watch go them. Go watch a movie. I have watch enjoyed it. all of your shorts for real and uh, for quite some time. Thanks, man. And, and your videos too, the, you know, the tutorials, the topics, all that stuff. So definitely go check it out. Well, awesome. Appreciate it. It's been so great talking to you. We are going to get that intro or outro and uh, get out of here. Yeah, that was the best way to end a podcast is by saying you're about to listen to the outro. (laughs) (laughs) And here we go. All right. See you guys later. Bye. We are filmed. The We Are Film Podcast is brought to you by the Black Mountain Visuals Podcast Network.